Hello everybody, for today's example, um, we're going to walk through how you can get data from the Federal Reserve directly, similar to what we did with the World Development Indicators from the World Bank. And then I will show you how you can visualize changes in, um, in prices and in unemployment rates and other key economic variables over time. Um, I will also show you how you can use a seasonal decomposition to break um, different trends out of uh, a given time series. This isn't officially part of your exercise. Technically, in your exercise, your only requirement is that you make um, that you find some data somewhere and you visualize it over time. It can be any data set you want. It doesn't have to be data from Fred. It doesn't have to be data from anywhere. Um, it just has to be some sort of data set that has a time-related variable in it, and you're going to show changes over time using that variable. Um, so this. This example here is mostly a, an example of one way of doing this um, using some common um, economic policy indicators like GDP and unemployment and inflation and things like that. Um, and it's also going to demonstrate some, a really cool package called um, TidyQuant um, that lets you get data directly from either the Fed or from places like Yahoo Finance and other things if you want like stock information. Um, there are ways of getting stuff there. You can even, if you have like a Bloomberg subscription to like a terminal, you can use your Bloomberg API key to directly get data from Bloomberg and bring that into R. Um, I don't have one of those. I have no interest in doing anything with stocks. I'm not a macroeconomist or a finance person. Um, but you can get like cool GDP information from the Fed. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to switch over to our studio here. I already have a project set up with an empty R markdown file um, ready to go. Um, I don't have a data folder because we're just gonna get the data directly from the internet. We're not gonna download it somewhere and put it as a CSV file in here. So really it's just, I have a single R markdown file in here. So to do this, um, we want to load our packages like normal. We'll always start with library tidyverse. We'll spell it right. And it's gonna give all the warnings and messages, that's fine. Um, the package we care about the most for getting data from the Federal Reserve directly is called, um, let me just verify, it's, yeah, tidyquant. So tidyquant, which you can install with the packages panel. And if we run this, this is actually a very talkative package. It gives all sorts of warnings and details, and they even have like this link to tutorials, and you can do all sorts of, like there's a one hour course that you can take on TidyQuant. Neat, you should check that out. Um, when I'm knitting and stuff though, I don't want to actually see those. And so I'll say warning equals false and message equals false. And so now this should be a nice quiet chunk, great. Okay, so the way the Federal Reserve works and the way you can get data from them is it's similar to the World Bank. So if you remember at the World Bank, you had to go to data.worldbank.org and then search for some indicator. And then in the URL up at the top, it had some cryptic code that you could then copy and paste into R and then get that data. It's the same process for the Fed. So the St. Louis Fed, um, they're the branch responsible for um, publishing all the, the data from the Federal Reserve. So if you search for FRED data or go to fred.stlouisfed.org, um, you'll get this data portal here. And so what we can do is just search for something like GDP. And if you search for GDP, it should bring up a whole bunch of different indicators. Um, and the, the crazy thing about FRED is they have like, I think over 100,000 different indicators that you can work with, um, all sorts of different time series data. Um, that is sliced up in different ways. So you have to pay attention to what is actually offered here. So like this real gross domestic product, this is in 2012 dollars. So everything has been accounted or been adjusted for inflation and it is seasonally adjusted. And so they've taken any seasonality out of the data and it is quarterly. And so it's quarter one, two, three, and four of every year. So it's a whole bunch of observations. And so that's what this variable does. But then sometimes you get um, this is also quarterly. They have annual versions. They have non-adjusted for inflation versions. They have non-adjusted for seasonality versions. Um, they've got a whole bunch of different things. And so really you just kind of have to search around on the website and find the one you want. Um, so here, this is real gross domestic product. This is probably one that we want. Um, this is adjusted for inflation. It's taken the seasonality out of already and it is quarterly. We can see a plot of it already. They conveniently put the recession lines on here. 
Um, so you can tell when recessions were, there's the Great Recession where GDP declined by a lot. Um, so the way we can get this directly into R, rather than like clicking on download and CSV and then loading it in and doing all of that, is the URL has a code at the end. This is GDP C1. Um, I think they also include it right here. So we can also grab it from there. So if we copy GDP C1 and paste that into our R script, the function will come and find this exact um, data set and then bring that into R for us. Um, I've already made a list of kind of the main data sets I want to bring in. Um, so let me go ahead and grab that so that I don't have to type it all. This is all directly from the course website from the example page um, where I have a more complete version of all of this code that I'm showing here. Um, so the function we use, rather than use the WDI function that we used before, that was just for the world development indicators, we use this TQ underscore get function, which uses tidyquant to get data. Um, we have to feed it a list of indicators that we want. And so these are a whole bunch of um, Federal Reserve indicators. These are different codes that I found. Here's the GDP that I was just looking at. We also have retail sales, initial unemployment claims, inflation, the unemployment rate, and then the start and end times of recessions. So we can actually plot recession bars on our charts and so we can see when recessions are. Um, this next argument is the source of the data. This economic.data, the only reason I know this is because I looked in the help file and it says, if you want to get data from Fred, use economic.data. Um, if you want to get data from Yahoo Finance, they have a different uh, data source here. And then instead of feeding these things in, you feed it the stock, um, the abbreviation. So if you want Apple, it would be AAPL, um, things like that. And so you can get actual stock quotes and stock um, prices directly from there. And then you can give it a date um, where it's going to start. So this is going to start from January 1st, 1990. It's going to get all of these variables from Fred. So if we run this, it should reach out to Fred's servers and get those variables. And now we have one data set here that I called Fred Raw. And I've tried to get you into the habit of always like having kind of the raw data set that you get directly from a website or you get directly from a CSV file. And then you make a separate one called like Fred Clean or smaller subsets of this messy raw data set. This is especially important with um, data that you get from Fred with tidyquant. Because if you notice, we only have three variables here. When we use the world development indicators of uh, package that let us get a column for each of the indicators that we wanted. This is not giving us a column for each of the indicators. If we look at it, we have symbol. The reason it's named symbol is because this is originally invented for stocks. And so this would be like AAPL or something. And then we have a date column and then we have a price column. It's not really price. Again, it's based on stock language. And so if this was stocks, that would be the symbol of the company. And that's the stock price. Um, when you're working with, with, uh, data from the Federal Reserve. This is just the actual value. And so if we scroll down far enough, we'll see unemployment numbers, and then it'll say price, but really that's the unemployment. Um, but if you notice, it's just those three columns. We have symbol, we have date, we have price. And so if we want to see the unemployment numbers, those are going to be way down here. Here's the initial unemployment claims. So there were 399,000, yeah, 399,000 unemployment claims the week of um, March 26, 2011. Um, and so all of the indicators we got are basically stacked on top of each other in this giant, really long, tidy data set. And the reason they did that is actually good. Um, some of the data that you get from Fred is on an annual basis, and some of it is on a monthly basis, and some is quarterly. Some, like these unemployment claims, are weekly. So if you wanted to lay this out like a full rectangular spreadsheet, um, you would have to have a row, not just for every year, like we do with like the world development indicators or every month, you need a row for every week, basically, because we have the unemployment claims there. And then most of the weeks are going to be empty because we just have like a single annual GDP number or a, a monthly GDP number. And so it doesn't actually line up once we start trying to get this into rectangular shape. So to help us not worry about having a billion empty rows, um, they give it. They give us the data in really long format, so then we can then filter and create our own smaller data sets that are spaced at the right intervals. Um, so, for instance, if we want to plot GDP, um, 
or we'll plot retail sales because that's a fun one. So we just want to look at retail sales over time. Um, so what we can do is make a smaller data set. We'll make a new chunk down here. We'll make a smaller data set here called just retail sales. We're going to base it on Fred Raw. And then we're going to add a pipe and we're going to say filter. And we want only the rows where the symbol equals that code for retail sales. So now if we run it and we come look at retail sales, we have 340 rows starting 1992. They didn't have any retail sales data from 1991, I guess. And if we go all the way down, we should go up to April 2020. So all the retail sales numbers there um, should be showing up. I think this is measured in millions of dollars. So this is, if we look at this number, that is three, that's $400,000 million. Four trillion, maybe 400 billion. I don't know. Math is hard. It's a lot of money. This is why I'm not a macroeconomist. This is why I study like IR and other things in political science. Um, it's a big number. So if we want to look at retail sales over time, we can plot it um, just using our normal ggplot stuff. Um, so we're going to say ggplot. The data we're going to look at is retail sales. And then we're going to map, if we look at the columns, on the x-axis we want date, and on the y-axis we want price, even though it's not really a price. So we say x equals date, y equals price, and then we can say geom line. And there is retail sales over time. This was not seasonally adjusted. You can tell because there's all sorts of peaks and troughs. This looks like a heartbeat over time. That's because, as we mentioned in the lecture, um, every fourth quarter has really high retail sales in the United States, and then the first quarter has very low retail sales. That's just how it works in this country for whatever reason. Um, you do see this dip right here. I'm guessing that's 2008. Yep, there's 2008, 2009. That's the Great Recession where retail sales crashed and then they've come back up and there's COVID-19 right there. Okay, so that's basically how you visualize this stuff is um, you just use geom line, you filter out the exact symbol that you want. So if we want to look at unemployment claims, for instance, let's do that. We can just do lines. So we'll come down here and we'll say, we have to make a smaller data set first. And so we'll just say unimp claims. So we're gonna use the Fred raw data and we'll filter so that um, I think the symbol I think it's ICSA let's verify yep ICSA initial unemployment claims so we just want the unemployment claims so if we check this should be on a weekly basis now um, it says price but that's really the number of people who applied for unemployment that week um, so now we can plot it we can come here and say ggplot unemp claims a s x equals date y equals price even though it's not really a price and then geom line and we should get this terrifying plot um <laughs> this is the pandemic right there this is the great recession um that was like the highest in generations the num highest number of unemployment claims for a very long time um, and here's right now, this is like shocking and terrifying and like, yeah. So yeah, we can see all sorts of like tragic things right here with this time series stuff. So that's fun. Let's just close that plot because it's mind boggling. Okay. So yeah, we're, that's how you show change over time. Um, we can do some other things to kind of improve this. One really cool trick we can do is we can copy what the Fed did and add um, shaded areas on our plots here to show when recessions were. And so that way that helps explain why there was this dip in uh, retail sales. So to do that, we can do a little bit of um, data manipulation to figure out when the recessions start and end. Um, if we look at the data set that we got from Fred, we'll just call this recessions raw. We'll make a new smaller data set from Fred raw and we'll filter it where symbol is equal to, what is the code? 
US REC is the, the recession data. So US REC. So if we look at recessions raw now, which should be this one here, um, it looks like this is monthly data. So this is in January 1990, there was no recession. And in February 1990, there was no recession. But in August 1990, there was a recession. So whenever there's a one, that means we're in a recession. And whenever there's a zero, it means we're not. So that's, that's all this column is showing. It still says price. It's not really price. It's just saying, yes, recession, no recession. OK, so in order to plot what the Fed does, so if we come back here, what they have here is the shaded area behind the line that is basically a rectangle. So if we can plot our own rectangles and say start the rectangle whenever a recession starts and then end the rectangle whenever the recession ends and then have the bottom of the rectangle be the very bottom of the plot and have the top of the rectangle be the very top of the plot, we can recreate those same recession bars. So we need to figure out the beginnings of recessions and the ends of recessions. And that's all the data we need. Right now, we have every single month in like from 1990 till today, where it just says zeros and N1 and N0. And that's not helpful. We just want to see when it switches from zero to one and when it switches from one to zero, because that's when the recession turns on and when the recession turns off. So one little trick we can do to figure this out when the recession start and end is we can make a new column here in our um, recessions data. We'll just say recessions start end. We'll base this on recessions raw because that's the, the filtered data we have. What we're going to do is make a new column called uh, using mutate. And this is going to be called recession change. So if we look at this data, what we can do to figure out when there's a change is if we say, look at this month here, was there a recession in the previous month? If not, then there was no change. And so if we go with every one of these rows, say, look at the previous one, and is that different? No. If we get up to here, is one different from the previous one? Yes, we have a difference there. And so that is where something happens. So if we can tell R to look at every single row, and subtract the value from the previous row, then we'll be able to see when those changes actually happen. So to do that, we can um, say price, because again, that's the name of that weird column there, minus lag price. So the lag function tells R to look at the row previous to the one that it's currently on. So this is going to go through every single row, look at the current price or the 0, 1 status, and it's going to subtract whatever it was before. So if we run this now, we should have a data set called recession start end, which should be here. So we still have our symbol date price, but now we have a column for recession change. So there was no change in any of these months, and then suddenly there's a change. And then there's no change um, because we're in the middle of the recession. Once we end the recession, there's a negative one. And so that's where we left the recession. The recession ended in between March and April of 1991. And everything else is zero. So the nice thing about this is if we can filter this data set to get rid of all of these zeros for recession change, it will only show us the rows where either the recession starts or the recession ends. And then that's all we're left with. So if we come here and say filter recession change is not equal to zero, that will only keep the rows that say either one or negative one. And if we look at it now, there we go. So a recession started in August 1990, ended in April 1991. Another one started in 2001, and another one started in 2008 and ended officially in 2009, but it's taken forever to recover from that. So those are our three recessions for this time period, which is cool. We're not quite there, though. Because we have, we have those rows, but we need a column that says recession start date, and we need a column that says recession end date. So we need to somehow rearrange this a little bit so that we can get um, those two columns that we care about, the starting date and the ending date. Because that's all we need for plotting it again. To get these rectangles, we need a start date and an end date. And we need each of those as columns. So we could attempt to do some um, pivoting and changing some of these um, rows to columns and then filtering and rearranging and stuff like that. That's a little bit tricky. Um, I, 
in this situation, it's actually easier to make a whole new data set from scratch, um, but use the exist that, that tidy data to do it. So we're going to make a data set called just recessions. This is our final recessions data. And we're going to say it is a tibble, which just means a data frame. It's just an empty data set. If we run it right now, we have a zero observation, zero variable data set. So that's not super helpful. We're going to make a column in this new data set called start. And it's going to equal, if we look here, all we really need are the dates where this recession change equals 1, because that's when the recession started. When it hits negative 1, that means the recession ended. So if we can filter this data set to only look where recession change is 1, and then just keep those dates, then those are the only dates we need. So we can do that by saying um, recessions start end. Or we're going to filter. Here we go. We're going to say filter recession start end. And recession change is equal to 1. So that will let us look just at those rows where recession change is equal to 1. And then we only want that column of the dates. So to do that, we can actually use this dollar sign operator, which tells us grab, the, grab one of the columns from that data set. And that column is date. Okay, so that will get us the start dates of the recessions. Then we can get the end dates by doing basically the same thing. Filter, recessions, start, end. But here we want recession change to equal negative 1, because that's when the recession ended. And we want just the date column. So if we run this now, we should have our recessions data that just has the start dates, and the end dates. And that's all we need. So with this, we can overlay this data now on our time series plot. And we can see the, the changes um, in GDP or in unemployment or whatever that may have happened because of the recession. So let's, instead of looking at retail sales and instead of looking at the terrifying unemployment claims, let's look at GDP. So let's just copy the unemployment claims code for the plot, paste it here. Um, we're going to call this GDP. So we're going to filter that Fred raw data and grab, uh, what was the code? I think it was GDPC1, maybe. Yep, GDPC1. So we're going to plot GDPC1. If we do this, we should just get a basic line, which looks like that. So there's GDP. It drops in 2008. Again, that was because of the recession. But now we need to overlay the recession start and end dates on there so that we can actually see it. So to do this, we're going to add a new layer before G online. The reason we're doing it before is because we want it to go on the plot first, and then we're going to put the line on top of it. If we don't do that, then the, the rectangle is going to go on top of the line which is OK if we're making it semi-transparent. But if we weren't making it transparent, then it would cover up the line, and we don't want that. So we're going to use geomrect to plot a rectangle. We're not going to use the GDP data. We're going to specify a separate data set here. So we're going to say data equals recessions. And then we have to specify different aesthetics. So to plot a rectangle, if you remember when we did uh, the annotate function where we drew arbitrary rectangles onto the plot. You need an x min, an x max, and a y min, and a y max. And those are the main aesthetics you need for the rectangle. So if we say as x min equals, we called it start. So we want to use that start column, start. x max equals end. For the y, we can just feed it a number. We could say 0. We could say 10,000, and it would start at 10,000. Um, one trick is you can actually just say, or y min, we can say negative you know, neg equals negative infinity. So it's just going to start at the very, very bottom of the plot. And then for y max, we can say infinity. So it's just going to go from very bottom all the way to the very top. Um, we want to fill this with a color. So we'll say fill equals yellow, sure. We'll make it semi-transparent, alpha equals 0 0.5. And we'll add a plus sign so it gets the line 2, and we'll run it. And it yells at us. Because, this is good to know, it says that it can't find 
price. And this is confusing because we're using price here and saying, look at the price column in GDP and plot that. And if we look at the GDP data set, we have a column called price. And so why is it yelling at us? The reason is anything you put in ggplot, this main code up at the top, becomes global for every other layer that you include. And so we didn't have to specify in gonline that we're going to use x and y because we did that here. It's picking up the x and y from the GDP data set and it's working down here. With this gonrect though, we're using a completely separate data set, the recessions data, which doesn't have a column named price. Um, we're using start and end and then making it go up and down infinitely. But because we specified the aesthetics up here, it's actually trying to still use them down in geomrect. It's trying to look for an x value called date and a y value called price down here. And it doesn't exist. We don't have those columns. So there are a couple alternatives. We could move all of this stuff down into geomline and just have an empty ggplot here. We probably don't want to do that, though, because if we want to overlay anything else in our data, um, then we have to specify the data set again and re-specify the aesthetics. This is the only layer in the whole plot that is using the recessions data. So we probably don't want to move everything down. What we can do instead is there's one argument in every geom um, that we haven't used yet called override AES, or not override AES, it's called inherit AES. And we can say false. So what this means is that this layer here will not pick up any of the built-in aesthetics. Like we set this, this should be global. And so it's applying down to this layer and that's what's making it break. But if we say inherit AES equals false, then it won't actually pick up the X and Y from up here and it'll just ignore them. And so now if we plot it, we're not picking up the X and the Y. And there is our time series with um, the recession bars. And that's great. We have our time series. Um, so that is basically how you do this stuff. Um, this is how you do lines. Um, you can do this as bars. You can do this as heat maps. Probably not necessarily with the, the FRED data, but with other um, sources of time series information. If you look at the, the example page for today, um, the second half of the example, I go through how to decompose this. Um, not GDP, that's already seasonally adjusted, but if you look at retail sales, this is really bumpy and looks like a heartbeat. There are ways that are fairly easy, I have the code there for you, to extract the seasonality and you're left only with the trend and with unexplained parts of the trend. So if we look at that really quick, you, I'm not going to do it in the video here, but this is something you can do fairly easily. Um, you can create plots like this, where it takes um, the actual data. So there's our retail sales, there's our recessions. That's the general trend in retail sales. This is the seasonal part of retail sales. And so this is the, the quarterly effect. And then this is the unexplained parts. And so there's just kind of random movements in retail sales. And here's the COVID effect. We're way down low because of this pandemic. Um, you can see the effect of it on the economy right there. Um, so if you want to figure out how to do that, go ahead and look at the, the example code on the website and you can follow along and, and try it. It's fun. It's a super cool skill to have. Um, and you make really impressive charts um, with like actual public data for like public finance and policy and stuff. So um, head over to your exercise for today or keep working on the example here and have a fun time.